webinar with um, Attila. Now, Attila is really, I think, a go-to person in Australia for anything about succulents. And I'm really intrigued that you're going to talk to us today about bottle trees and boabs, uh, Attila. Um, you've got a lot growing in your garden, I believe. And That's uh, correct. We'll, we'll be seeing some of those um, as we go through the uh, presentation today. Um, for those, I'm sure most people know about Attila, but you established with your brother Paradisia Nursery. And That's uh, correct. You've, you've made the most wonderful um, collection. And I really found your work on the Australian succulents, which we're going to talk about, uh, I guess, uh, a little bit with these bottle trees, but also in the next uh, webinar next week with your edible ones. Um, I think that's was groundbreaking, really. I don't really think that people had drawn attention to our native succulents until you started uh, writing about them and, and letting us know about them. So thank you for that. Um, Attila's already got his screen up there to share. And just uh, if you, everyone can just um, mute themselves if, uh, if we haven't already muted you. Uh, and we'll have time for questions at the end so you can, you know, unmute then. Um, or you can put up a question um, through the, um, the the notes at the bottom. So Attila, thank you very much and take it away. Jennifer, thank you. All right. Well, uh, at times I'll be talking very quickly. At times I'll slow down. I'll be showing pictures sometimes very quickly and lots of pictures of plants in habitat and in cultivation. But hopefully uh, I'll still be able to convey information without skipping over things too cursorily. Anyway, uh, look, here goes, Australian bottle trees and boabs. There's a lot of confusion about what those two names mean because, you know, generally speaking, uh, for general purposes, boab or boabab is representing the genus Adansonia. Bottle tree generally refers to brachychitans. Now, there's a lot of people who suggest that they're related, like uh, uh, divergent evolution. It's actually not. They're not related at all. And I'm going to be showing you a little bit of taxonomy as to why they are so different and how different they can be to each other. Anyway, uh, let's just get, begin with the generalized term bottle tree. Everyone tends to use these words to describe the trees that we like. And I've traveled all across Australia looking at plants in habitat, especially big old trees, ancient trees, historic trees. And uh, sometimes in remote towns, I'd talk to locals, get advice on dirt tracks and roads to explore. And in one particular town, I had some local Indigenous folk I met up with in a pub and I'm sitting with them at the table and uh, one of them was a, a, an Indigenous elder. And, and as I'm chatting, I'm trying to explain what I'm after. I'm after bottle trees, trees that are big, that are ancient, that have got maybe scars or, or, or engravings or anything, anything on them. Anyway, and they're a little bit confused at the table as to what I'm actually after. Because, I mean, there are bottle trees everywhere, even around the town. I said, look, I'm, I'm looking for something that, and I, I point to a beer bottle. I said, I'm looking for anything that's shaped like this, really shapely like a bottle out in remote tracks and trails. Anyway. Suddenly the elder, like an epiphany, he just hits himself on the head and says, oh, as if, why didn't you tell me? Anyway, he draws me a mud map and I think, oh, I'm onto something here. And I follow the mud map and the track and I, with Michelle, we drive, my wife Michelle, we drive over 100 kilometres down a dirt track and we didn't see anything. On the way back, I thought, oh, it's a bum steer. On the way back, we're driving back and Michelle said, stop the car. I stopped the car in the middle of nowhere and she says, there it is. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, that wasn't a bunch there at all. It was my fault because I actually pointed to a bottle and uh, <laughs> I thought any tree with a bottle. And interestingly enough, if you research bottle trees on the internet, you will actually find trees with bottles, glass bottles all over them. So it's not uncommon. To, anyway, it was my mistake. But, wow, you know, that was several hours of driving into remote places and yeah, oh, gee, I've gone to some places looking for these trees. Anyway, generally for us in the horticulture trade, a bottle tree represents any tree with a bottle-shaped trunk. So it's got nothing to do with glass bottles at all. Anyway, uh, I've gone to some remote places. Michelle's in the distance there. We're following a trail. We walked up a mountain, hours of walking, hours of walking and exploring, looking, not finding one bottle tree. We get to the pinnacle. Our pursuit was to a place called oh, Bottle Tree Bluff. Is this another bluff? 
we looked. There's Michelle over there to the right, looking over the balcony, looking and finding nothing, no sign of a bottle tree anywhere. Well, that's the bluff up top there, and there's no sign looking back in a cross where on earth are the bottle trees i mean it says bottle tree bluff is it a bluff like the indigenous story we got from the pub anyway i couldn't find anything i found orchids and succulents and other things and looking across the plain there was no sign of any bottle tree i could i'm not that poor sighted with spotting these things but i couldn't see a single bottle tree anyway how disappointing now some a little bit of uh science regarding bottle trees bottle trees that name is used for many tree species around the world, including these more well-known examples. In Madagascar, there are numerous Adansonia and a genus called Moringa. Also in South America, there are various Ciba, Carissia, the old name, and also a thing called Cavanlesia, which looks exactly like a brachypine, exactly. Uh, uh, this is one of our favourites. It's from South America, from the Amazon. There's Michelle. It's uh, called, oh, this is in our garden. This is Michelle's photograph of a carissia or sea bar. It's huge. And those thorns, those thorns grow bigger and bigger and bigger at the base. Each year they get larger. Look at that. Oh. Now, in Africa, there's also Adansonia digitata and Pacopodium leite. They call them bottle trees over there. So bottle trees are everywhere. But in Australia, we actually have two dominant uh, representatives of what's referred to as a bottle tree, the Adansonia gregorii. It's had a name change, but I still use gregorii. And Brachychiton repestris. But a lot of people aren't aware that Australia has three more bottle tree species, two of which are rare, restricted in distribution. Hence, they are hardly known outside scientific circles. One is fairly well known, Brachychiton australis. But this is known by very few people, Brachypiton compactus. And as the name implies compactus, it's a short, stumpy, broad, uh, it's a bottle tree. And then there's Brachypiton horseri, which was found in recent years in a housing estate. And there's only a few specimens found to exist, and that's all that is known. It's now been spread across the country with grafting and cuttings and seed, but uh, it's, it's extremely rare. Anyway, back to the two genera, Adansonia and Brachychiton. These are both Australian, but Adansonia is interesting because it evolved elsewhere on another continent and is a recent, generally, a recent introduction to the Australian continent, whereas Brachychiton evolved here. So it's actually called convergent evolution, not divergent evolution. But um, there's the common names again. Sometimes I'll cross over between the two of them. Now, that's where Adansonia has migrated into Australia ugh, many, many thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, and it's spreading across the northwest. Brachychiton, on the other hand, is widespread across the continent and evolved here. So they, they've come from different places. Now, this is a typical scene with Adansonia, and there's the name, Adansonia gregorii. Now, some people say this is bigger of the two. The bottle tree, the Queensland bottle tree, is not as large. Yet here, the Queensland bottle tree is as large. So there are some specimens that are larger than, in fact, many of the Adansonia. Now, uh, Brachychiton repestris, there's the name bottom left there, you can see it. Uh, interestingly, the comparison between Adansonia and Brachychiton is so uh, contrasting, it's not often you can get two plants and examples to compare so you can see the differences. But I'll, let me explain some things. Here, there's the fruit of the Adansonia, the flower of the Adansonia. Now, they're so unusual because what you've got is the Adansonia flower in a cross section. You've got these sepals turned back. You've got the petals, large petals, and you've got the male parts poking out and also the female receptor here. Now, that's an Adansonia flower. Let's compare that with a Brachychiton flower. Firstly, I don't see any sepals. These aren't, in fact, petals. These are called petaloids, where the petals and the sepals are merged into one single structure. Inside, I can't see any male part extending or female parts at all. So, oh, again, sepals, petals, male parts, female parts. It's so different to a brachychiton. It's like they're cheese and chalk. No, they're not closely related. In looking into the brachychiton flower, there is something inside the flower. Of course, there's the, the reproductive parts. But what are we looking at there? Well, I've got the ovaries, the green part, our female receptor, I believe. But there's no male parts. 
The flower is monoecious. That's a term describing a plant where the flowers are either male, totally male, or totally female. The trees could be either, and at times both, but oh, is that male or female? It's still a brachychiton, same species, but I can't see the ovaries, so that's probably a male. That's definitely a male. There's no sign of ovaries at the base of the flower, but that doesn't look like anthers with pollen. That looks like, so it's rather confusing, but these are brachychiton flowers. All of these are of the one species, but just variation within the species. But looking at them, I can say male, male. Oh, that's a female. Oh, there's the ovaries. That's a male, and they're, they're all males too. So a plant could have nothing but male flowers or nothing but female flowers. Sometimes, now, Adansonia again, you've got a single fruit, big single flower, these petals. Uh, now, um, the fruit of an Adansonia, when it falls from a tree, single big egg-shaped structure, it's kind of brittle. When it hits the ground, it often shatters, and inside the seeds will then fall out. This is the African Adansonia to compare. Now, brachychitans, on the other hand, there's a lot of what appear to be fruit hanging in a tree, but... Um, I wouldn't want to suggest trying to count them because whatever you're going to try and suggest if you were to try and count them is you'd be wrong. Here, I could ask you, how many fruit are hanging here? The answer is you're wrong. There isn't three fruit hanging here. Yeah, there are three pods, but let's not get too confusing at this stage. Let's just, uh, uh, there's, there's Brachychiton repestris. They're the seed pods. And here is a mixture of pods. The Adansonia genus is represented on the top row. Below that line, all of these are brachychitans, different species of brachychitans. But um, to explain the major difference between the fruit is as follows. In a brachychiton, you've got this is a female flower. You've got the ovary, three parts, one, two, three, four, five. What typifies a brachychiton is there are five segments to the ovary, five ovaries that are joined at the base. Now, those five ovaries are very important because when the flower, that's the perianth, the old flower, and this old, the old petaloids, they've curled back. So all the old flower remains, but from the center of the flower, the ovaries have extended. And oh, only four of the ovaries have matured or uh, been pollinated. So it's interesting. Oh, sorry. What have I done there? Uh, you've got here, there's the petaloids, the old flower, an old flower. You can still see the remains of the flower. And oh, I'm sorry. I've just skipped it. I'm on a new computer and it's just responding a bit uh, out of order for me. Now, you've got here one, two, three, four, five, five segments, like in an orange, the five segments of an orange. With an orange, it's a single fruit, an orange. Well, this is a single fruit with the five ovaries all being fertilized. And here you can see the ovaries are now bled out. Each of these segments of the fruit are called follicles. So now in terms of what we're looking at here, all of these three segments are follicles, all from a single, all from a single flower. So from within that flower, all three of these came from the one flower, one fruit. These are brachychitons, but in this case, only one ovary was fertilized. And you can see a single large fruit. Here you can see the same species and with the old perianth and old flower, one, two, three, four, five, five ovaries. Only three got fertilized in this occasion, but you can clearly see the point I'm making that these follicles or segments are all part of a single fruit from a single small flower. So uh, now you can appreciate better. Adansonia are totally different in having a singular fruit, large, as opposed to these segmented fruit. And all of these came from a single flower. So understanding brachychitons now, they're so, so different to Adansonia. And here you've got a cluster of flowers. Brachychitans always produce flowers in clusters, whereas Adansonia, every branch can only have one flower and one fruit hanging from the tree. Now, leaf morphology comparisons. Adansonia, after the dicot leaves, juvenile, when it reaches 30 centimetres high, the leaves are palmate. Now, those leaves, and when they're a metre high, two metres high, three metres high, the leaves don't change. They're the same, same, same. Even as an adult tree, they're the same. But brachychitans, 
They're different. They're morphologically so diverse and interesting. The top row represents brachychite and discolour. All that or top row is just the one species at varying stages throughout its life. It's almost like one year, two year, three and three to five year. And up here, you've got 10, 20 year old trees. So the plant has actually changed shape. Now, it's so diamorphically interesting. Scientists, when they first encountered this species and gave it a name, this particular one was given a totally different species name to this tree because they didn't understand at the time that that was just the juvenile morphology of how complicated. Now, this is the row. This row here represents Brachychite and Populneus, quite a common, but there are two genetic variations of the, the Western arid uh, subspecies and the uh, East Coast subspecies. Now, this row here represents Brachychite and Repestris at varying stages from juvenile to mature leaves, and this represents Brachychiton compactus, a beautiful species. But anyway, uh, I've been doing work with Brachychitons now for about 40 years. And these are all plants grown in our garden. We've got a one-acre garden and we do experiments. And this is an example of some of the comparative work we're doing with trying to sort out some of the confusion between these species. Uh, this is something quite obvious. This is called the broadleaf bottle tree, and this is called the narrow leaf bottle tree. Well, that's nice and easy, isn't it? <laughs> but even within the one species, these are two trees, left and right, one on the right, one on the left. These are both seed of the same species, collected from the same tree, but that's how genetically variable the species can be with its leaf morphology. Isn't that interesting? So it's nothing like an Adansonia. Now, this is uh, typifying how a Brachychiton repestris would grow. This leaf here is the juvenile leaf morphology within a one-year, two-year-old seedling. Second, third, and fourth, and fifth year, you've got this stage, progressing to this stage, to this stage. And finally, this small leaf here. This is only the twisting of this leaf. This is what's considered a mature tree. So when people ask me, for advice on how long before my bottle tree produces flowers or develops a big bottle well i ask people well how long is a piece of string but you can actually tell by looking at the leaf morphology as to what level of maturity the tree's at whether it's uh, two meters tall or 10 meters tall if the leaves are like this it's mature enough to flower so you can actually interpret a plant by looking at its leaves. At Ansonia, on the other hand, the leaves never change, whether they're juvenile or adult. After the bean leaves, the first two dicots, all the leaves stay the same. Now, I love trees. Trees, trees, trees. I love trees. Most people actually love trees. But you know, gardeners are scared of trees. They're scared of planting them. I mean, we'd like admiring trees. Trees have lots of virtues. Everyone loves a tree. That's not when they're shedding in your garden, but... People do like trees, but when trees get large, they become a threat. They're threatening. They're threatening in, uh, to our houses, to our livelihood, to our health. But, you know, I love trees, big trees, the creatures that live under, under them or in them and associate with them. Grand trees have incredible stories to tell and, and are admired by everybody. But when you get branches, huge trees have huge problems. And most Australians don't like and councils and governments don't like to plant huge trees in public places. So we plant modest trees that tend to be easy to manage, colourful, decorative. But our native trees, whenever used, I mean, oh, so sad <laughs> with the power lines there, that's really sad. But, you know, here too, a eucalypt that looks like it's inappropriately used near electrical power lines. Now, look at this branch here. It's gone around the corner. Around. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, what a mess. Oh, that's so sad. But, you know, this is poor use of a tree. Um, trees like to be free to express themselves. This tree almost takes on a human form. Can you see the human form in... Uh, I better leave that. There's, oh, there's Michelle. There's a human form there in the bottom. Dude, get distracted. Okay. Now... Trees also have uh, beautiful buttress roots and roots that uh, can be very, very pleasant to sit on and around and enjoy. People love seeing tree roots. Tree roots are wonderful. But, you know, again, that thing about big branches, well, also big roots. I mean, uh, you wouldn't want to plant something like that too close to your house, a banyan fig. Hello, Michelle. Michelle takes many of the pictures 
in my presentation, so I have to acknowledge her from time to time. So thank you, Michelle. Now, so I got a great interest in trees, but also utilization of trees in the landscape. But I do understand and appreciate where people find trees problematic and, and to be feared. But what about boabs and bottle trees? How do they compare in the fear rating? Well, it so happens when I ask people, I tend to find everybody loves them, wants to hug them. They want to refer to them in a uh, in, in a human terms, like, oh, that's a big mama, or that's a granddaddy. Or the, they're giving it names. Anyway, the uh, connection with humans, this one's in the Darwin, uh, in a car park, and I'm trying to interpret uh, uh, the concrete work, the, the bitumen here, the car park, and I'm looking at roots causing a mess, and I'm looking at lit for litter. And, you know, I didn't find much in the way of leaf shed, branch shed. I didn't find much in the way of root damage to the uh, um, built environment. So I thought, you know, Atonsonias, but they're tropical. They're tricky to grow. They're not the easiest plant to grow in, in Melbourne, Sydney or Perth or whatever. But um, understanding them in habitat, there's something important uh, to interpret. There's actually water seepage here and these plants are drinking water. And that actually trunk is mostly full of water. So they in the town of Kananara, drought years, after several years, numerous years of drought, the stem has constricted. It's really, really stretching it, stretching and contracting. But um, after a good flooding rain, these trees can be large, fleshy, succulent. Even a little twig here, you can see engorged with water. It's a tank full of water. And here too, water runoff from the hill these two are probably the same age but this one has access to water and it's got its own water tank ironic this picture this house people are putting in water tanks all around australia we're being advised conserve water store water save water but what we're not acknowledging is that these trees have their own reserves of water can be used to eat and drink but the very fact that our association with putting in water tanks all across Australia is parallel with our interest in planting trees that have massive swollen trunks full of water as well. So there's just a bit of an irony there, but uh, anyway. Now, um, property values in Australia, I can state categorically that there's no question massive specimens of native bottle trees and boabs add more land value increases to properties on resale value like can you imagine um, um what a, a property might go for if it's got something like this in the front yard in value i don't know of any native plant in australia that could possibly uh add so much value to a property as what one of these trees could now this tree might be 100 or more years old 200 could even be and look at all the branches that might fall, hardly any. Could it blow over in the wind? Hardly at all. So really, you know, uh, it's not acknowledged for all its wonderful attributes, but more and more people are starting to appreciate not only the utilisation in public spaces, but also, too, that they can be grown with succulents like edeniums, and they can store water and... Uh, I'll say goodbye to Adam Sony. Let's look at brachychitans. Obviously, the bright red, startling red brachychitan uh, astrofolius. Now, there's one in flower. There's one that's not in flower. Now, they're the same age. This one's bigger than this one. Why is this one flowering and this one not? Well, they're fickle. Fickle, just like all brachychitans, genetically variable. Mm, and within the same species, you know, it can be, crisp, but they're really exciting. And here's one where it's flowering on one side, but not on the other. Why? There's a reason, but I haven't got time. Terry Raffi, oh, I'll introduce him. There's Rachychitin astrofolius, the same as those with the flowers I showed. Terry Raffi has been breeding and developing Rachychitins, hybrids, grafting them for decades. He's Australia, one of Australia's leading experts on the topic, and he developed a lot of hybrids. This particular one uh, is called Profusion because it's, it's such flowering I've never seen on a Brachychitin. It was bred. Its parentage comes from this tiny species called Bidwillii, Brachychitin Bidwillii. There it is in habitat. And it flowers even smaller and uh, flowers for many months of the year. And it was a 
breeding parent and I got some seed and put it down and within three months from planting the seed, I had my first flower. I thought, wow, from the brachychitin, the first flower, like three months. Wow. Now, another parent used in breeding is brachychitin discolor. This one is the uh, uh, Terry Rather use, uses this extensively because it flowers heavily most years, it's not a hard plant to grow at all. Brachychitin discolor, it's got a funny name, discolor. It reads like it should be spelt differently, but that's the correct spelling. I often have a joke with people, it's discolor, not that color, because it can be variable. Uh, this is all the same species, but there's some variation. I particularly like this one, it's beautiful. But brachychitin discolor, it has huge fruit and large seed, edible seed as well. And when trees do flower, they often drop to the ground once they've expired and they fall and sit littering lawns. And at times it can be quite untidy, but I find it's quite a visual sight to see the ground covered, carpeted in the flowers. And the flowers don't seem to shrivel up each day. They last for some days on the ground. But you can see brown ones there. So they've been falling for weeks and weeks, if not months. And, you know, they're actually a delight to see on a lawn like this. I mean, oh, how often would you have a lawn that's just covered in flowers and they're falling throughout the summer months? It's just a wonderful sight. But, you know, I notice when they get near the path, some of them, because they're fleshy, the flowers, they can be slippery. And here's a location where uh, they're occasionally swept off the path because they're a bit of a nuisance. But I notice the way they're falling into other ah, bushes and shrub. This is the Geelong Botanic Gardens and a young couple, Asian couple, walking along and they saw this bush in flower and they took pictures of its flowers. I thought, wow. And I noticed something. The way the flowers have been falling from the tree, they fall in a fashion or a manner by which the lower part, the heavy part, well, it falls first, and it falls in a manner that it just sits perfectly positioned and the flowers are still open. And so when they're open like that, the pollen is still available to be used by bees, even with the flowers sitting on the ground for days on end. And I noticed something, a benefit. If you take these flowers into the house, even without water, they will last for a day off you. And if you worried and got guests coming and you need them to last longer, put them in the fridge. But these will sit in a plate or a decoration or put them on a cake or and even near your computer, you won't need water in the vase. So these flowers, who, who appreciates all these virtues for these plants? Another important one, this is an image taken in the middle of summer and there's a towering eucalypt, huge eucalypt on the left-hand side. To the right of it, brachychitin discolor. Notice it's not as big. It's not as dangerous, but providing better shade through summer. Being deciduous, it will shed its leaves, allowing light in. What a wonderful virtue. Oh. Now, another species, Brachychitin populneus, it's a town in South Australia, and they've extensively used them as street plantings, this species, populneus. And the one on the right's got a beautiful trunk on it, and shell gathering the seed. Yeah, that's worth getting seed off that one, of course. There's its leaves. Brachychitin populneus. It's quite popular. It, it's very popular with farmers. Farmers absolutely love it. Um, there's Michelle photographing. It's a variable species. It's got flowers that aren't very large, but this is quite interesting. Farmers love it because this is habitat. There's eucalypts. It's a dry year, drought year. Yeah, the grass is dry. The farmers are stressed and they're trying to feed their livestock. And what's this in the foreground that looks as happy as Larry? Well, that's Brachychitin populneus. Now, this isn't how they should grow. It's actually not exactly natural. These have been cut and cut and cut. See below the branches sprinkling the ground. The farmer will cut the branches off with a chainsaw and feed them to his livestock, which are really thirsty and hungry. So, yes, they need to feed and keep the livestock alive, but look at the landscape. See, the eucalypts are stressing even in the background. You look at the colour, and yet these brachychitons, they have deep roots, just like the well, they can look after themselves with, you know, through dry years, drought years. But the fact that you can cut the branches off again and again, what does it mean to gardeners? Because if you've ever wondered about what and how much you can prune a brachychiton, this indicates that they can take quite severe pruning and still bounce back. But the farmer will keep chainsawing off the branches until there's almost nothing left. Oh, look at this poor tree here. Gosh, two trees. 
Uh, so, oh, where are all the branches? And yet still it lives on. It, what cruelty to plants. Farmers love this species because it provides important moisture and nutrients to cows if there's nothing else to eat. Now, I wonder also, besides pruning, these have never been pruned, I look at the shape and the balance and I look at the concrete and the bitumen and I think, what litter, what what falls? Oh, the fruit falls, yes, but I don't see too much in the way of a pro good for roundabouts, uh, low maintenance, and no branches are going to fall that are really a problem. In habitat, they also look very neat and tidy. There's one, two, three, four trees looking quite balanced. And in public places, I'm surprised that the brickwork is not damaged, the road's not damaged. What? Don't they have problematic roots? Are they that worthwhile? Even here in a footpath uh, situation, there's a little bit of distortion having to be repaired. But generally speaking, these are massive trees already in such narrow space, and yet they're hardly causing it. This tree's never been pruned. Is that the natural shape? How wonderful under power lines. Uh, here's a garden centre. You can go inside. I did. I had a look at the plants, all sorts of things, including natives. But there were no brachychitans, underappreciated. Do you know the best garden value in all of Australia happens to be brachychitan repestris? Do you know it's the only tree, the only Australian tree that's growing in every capital city botanic gardens? So I'm saying in Darwin, I visited and seen this species, Kings Park in Perth. In 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 uh, Brisbane, in Rockhampton, uh, in Sydney, in Melbourne, in uh, uh, Adelaide, and in Hobart. So this species grows in every capital city of Australia comfortably. What eucalypt species would even grow in every capital city? What acacia species will grow in every capital city? Now this is profound in that there's no other tree you could come up with that compares with its versatility and application across Australia and in a wide variety of situations. So, you know, people are starting to now idolise. These trees are now given godly respect in their natural habitat. Once upon a time, these trees used to be bulldozed, but now they're idolised. And it's always to do with the trunk that's absolutely appreciated it, it almost looks like hips, uh, the, the contoured shape of them. And here we've got a garden where someone has watered the lawn and this person next door hasn't watered his lawn. You notice this brachychitin has got lush vegetation, so it's really enjoying the watering from uh, uh, the lawn watering. Uh, and here you've got here this situation where there's brachychitin repestris in habitat. There's eucalypts all around. Now, uh, it not only grows naturally short and bushy, it's able to retain a, a lush green look for much of the year with or without water. Now, governments are now regarding the tree highly, and you'll notice this significant environmental area, the symbol of a bottle tree. Once they were considered of low regard, now they're considered with such high regard, it's extraordinary. Now, on the right here, you've got a brachychitin repestris in typical habitat, but if there were to be a grass fire or a forest fire of any kind, all of these plants could be almost destroyed. But if you notice, the recovery from this brachychitin indicates that it survived the fire better than any other plant. It recovered quicker. Why? Because it's full of water. It's got its own reserves. This grassland was burnt, and the, that red colour is new vegetation, new growth on the repestris, and this repestris was on the edge of it and only got partly burnt. But uh, uh, they recover and respond better after fire than most plants you can think of. That's the typical new growth of a brachychitin, turning from red then to green. Now, some brachychitin survived Victoria's bushfires in places where eucalyptus did not. Cherry Rathi. In the magazine, Growing Australian, it's a journal of Australian Plant Society, there's the specs. So, you know, these are sorts of things about brachychitans and adansonia that people don't fully understand or appreciate. And I wonder, because in this presentation, there are at least 20 
20 significant points of interest regarding these plants being utilised more so by gardeners, landscapers, the nursery industry. Those 20 points that I refer to are significant enough and yet, if you look on the internet or you look in most books, none of this information you'll find out there. It's just not available. So, you know, uh, anyway, driving through Queensland, this is typical habitat. There's no grass. The kangaroos, everything's been eaten to the ground. And uh, here there's a little bit of grass, but in the paddock, the livestock, there's sheep and there's a bottle tree there. And under the bottle tree in the shade, that's where the sheep were sitting in the deep shade. And I thought, gee, the shade of that brachycotton repestris on a hot sunny day, it was so hot, uh, you know, I, I've given them a bit of a scare, but they, they went back after. I was standing under a eucalypt and I thought, gee, they wouldn't sit here, would they? The sheep wouldn't sit here. Now, they like the shade next to the bottle tree trunk. And I noticed there's a deep sense of shade and coolness. There's a psychological thing. I don't know what it is, but uh, these trees... When I was uh, near the car and I'm taking pictures and whatever, I noticed Michelle had to get out of the car, just too hot sitting in the car, even with the window open. She stood under this tree here and the shade was so deep. She said, you've got to come over and stand here. I was surprised how remarkable the shade was and the effect it had upon me. There are various trees, native trees. Look at the shade under these trees. And here, look how deep the shade is. Look how deep the shade is. I put my head underneath and looked into the tree. It was 35 degrees Celsius. It was hot. I put my head in the tree and what it was. The birds knew where to go. Oh, hello. Uh, in fact, I was surprised how important these trees could be for oh, all manner of wildlife. Brachychitans are extraordinary at attracting. Oh, this is in our garden. And we've had them tailed emperors. They're common in Queensland, but they're not common in Melbourne. Uh, oh, but goodness gracious me, the brachychitans that I've seen attract wildlife. Uh, now, changing topic for a minute, I'm near the Victoria New South Wales border um, with the Land Care Organisation, and there's a representative here, and we've been going, we're going to a park because I've been pulled up to give advice on some plantings of brachychitans that were failing. Uh, this is the gentleman, I won't say his name, I won't give you the town name, but in the council and the land care plantings, a lot of bottle trees were planted all around town in the parks and gardens. And this is a gentleman that collected the seed. And I said, where did you collect the seed from? And he said, look, I, I got it off a really good bottle tree. I said, where from? He said, oh, the town of Moree. In Moree, there's a park and there's all these different kinds of brachychitans and there was one bottle tree right amongst all the other brachychitans and it had these fruit and seed. I collected the seed myself, but none of the trees I'm growing are going to grow into a bottle tree. What What's the story? Why are my trees not developing a bottle trunk? So that's why I was up there having a look. So I had a good study of the plants and even his garden has got them growing and they're quite large, but uh, I had a Good look at the leaves and the stem, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I can see something there now. That actually looks like a hybrid. These have, and I said, were there other brachychitans nearby or next to it that weren't bottle trees? He said, yeah, there were quite a few other brachychitans. I said, well, brachychitans are well known. They're renowned for hybridizing with the other species. So what you have here is you've collected seeds that are developing into hybrids. And all the trees, even though they're tall, tall trees, there's no indication whatsoever that the stems will swell. These are already flowering. They've already produced fruit. Nothing on them indicates the bottling of the trunk. He was so disappointed. He works for land care and uh, he's brought and they've planted so many of these trees all over the place, but none of them are developing trunks. Now, there's Michelle next to a brachychitin repestris, and it's huge. This is in habitat. I don't collect seeds off tall trees. I like to collect seeds off short trees. The shorter the tree, the better the potential of it developing into a short, stout trunk. And of course, you can prune the trees into shape, but there is the advantage of having good genetic stock to produce the best trees with the best trunks. It's not always easy peasy, just prune them and whatever. Now, there's lots I can discuss. I'm only touching on a few value points. This brachychitin has got a problem. You can see there's a split that's not going to get any better. It has to be dealt with. And there's issues like cracking and where 
trunks and branches have been cut away. The issues, I don't have time. This is a planting done north of Sydney at Gosford. And these plants are going to die. All these trees are going to die. They're dug from habitat. They're planted here, but they're going to die in Sydney. Iconic tree, iconic site, Sydney Botanic Gardens. This tree is leaning and it's going to fall and it's going to die. It's gone. So not all brachycotons are easy. Not everything about growing them is easy. But let me tell you, collecting the seed is easy. You've got to watch out for those spiky hairs because they irritate your eyes and skin. But once you get the hang of it, and some species of brachycotton produce seed as big as corn, and it can be eaten and used like corn. Also, it can be used to make an alternative drink like coffee. But also, I've been collecting seed and doing this for decades now. You can see quite large on the left-hand side. And I also grow them in, oh, I've been growing and selling this species for thousands and thousands of plants over the years. These are pulled out of our vegetable garden. And uh, what I do is I often do it and give demonstrations. These are people from the uh, Cranbourne Botanic Gardens, the staff there, and I'm demonstrating. I'll often do this to show people how enjoyable these plants could be when you pull them out of the ground as a vegetable from the vegetable garden. And here I'm showing how I've eaten these before and put them back in the ground and they'll regrow the roots every year or two. So um, here I'm cutting it and you can see peeling it. And after peeling it, they're all having a taste and they're quite excited. You can see I've peeled back the skin. I haven't washed it or anything. And it looks white like a vegetable, like a potato, like uh, like peeling back a banana. And oh, so much fun they had. But here's a little one. And it's the smaller they are and the fresher and the best. I mean, if you grow them like you do your vegetables, they'll grow rapidly. And if they're sweet and crisp and crunchy like an apple, uh, you've got to get them at the, uh, just that right stage. But notice here, this is the same plant that I ate in the previous slide, but you can see where the cut mark was with a knife. And even after I've cut off the root and having eaten it, I've planted it back and it's regrown new roots. And eventually, oh, look at that. Even without the roots, you cut them off and put them into pots and torture them. They seem to respond very well to torture. Look at that. Look at the root damage. The excavator's absolutely done some damage to those roots. The tree's going to have hardly anything. Oh, it won't have anything to, to function with for quite some time, but still the trees survive and put up with extreme conditions. Extraordinary. Now, this is Rudolf Schultz. He had the largest plantation in Australia, and he's been growing and selling and dispatching these around Australia, and most botanic gardens in Australia have trees that have been Origin, have originated from Rudolf Schultz. That's Rudolf Schultz at the left. And um, some of these, he, he does use irrigation. You can see at his feet there, there's an irrigation system and he feeds them and waters them. And there's one of them I peed on quite a few years in a row and it grew bigger, the trunk, than the others. And and I'm digging it out now, I'm moving it along and uh, just showing you the roots. That can be uh, fine fibrous roots. They're big tap roots where straight below, just going straight deep in the ground. I've cut them off with a saw. You can see me doing it there. There's Rudolph helping me put it in a trailer, taking it away. It's, you notice how big it is compared to all the other trees? That's because I peed on it. Anyway, there it is in our garden, one acre garden. Since then, about 25 years ago, we've been planting hundreds of them around the garden. And now there are many, many mature trees in the garden. This is our largest one at the moment and it looks awesome <laughs> but it's short and fat and there's no massive branches so it's easy to grow geelong botanic gardens all these originated from rudolph schultz uh, now i've nearly finished uh bottle trees and boabs i mentioned about 20 significant points that the horticultural trade have barely acknowledged and yet the horticultural industry can explore this and take this much, much further. These trees are iconic trees. Breaking chitons are iconically Australian, and they represent incredible potential in the horticultural industry, and it has yet to be fully realised. Some of what I've shared with you is in a publication that was revised. It's been produced at quite a few times, but revived in 2020, uh, 2013. And now it's 2023, and I've sold out again, multiple uh, printings. 
And I'm just about to produce an extended, uh, expanded version of this publication. And it covers a good part of what I've shared on the presentation in the presentation, but also a lot of new ideas and a lot of new thinking and the potential of where this popularity. I mean, bottle trees are extremely popular at the moment with the landscape gardeners and, and so forth, but uh, the real crux of it is yet to be explored fully. Now, edible succulents, this is for next week. For those of you who are interested and enjoyed today's presentation, I like succulent plants. I think bottle trees, uh, brachycritons, when they're young, they're succulent. The roots are succulent. You can eat them. Uh, Semi-succulent tree, they refer to it as. Well, uh, do you know the definition of a tree in the Oxford Dictionary, in the old Oxford Dictionary? Definition is a single trunk with wood inside. There's no actually wood inside a brachychiton, no proper wood. It's actually soft and it flexes in and out, just like with an adansonia. Now, wood cannot expand and contract. And yet adansonias and brachychitons have that, the brachychiton repestris, have that capacity. So that's an interesting thing. So, you know, it's more of a succulent than it is a tree. There's a the range of publications that I've been working on in recent years, and they're all basically Australian, and they're all basically xerophyte, so they're drought-hardy, water-wise. Ah, now, I'm done. This is a meal here representing Australian meat, native Australian meat, I won't say what, native Australian vegetables, I won't say what, even the garnish, Australian native. Do you know most restaurants serving Australian native plants only serve garnish or a little bit of a flavoring here and there but the almost the totality of this meal represents this succulents and australian meat uh and um anyway look enough for me any questions anything uh, i'm done <laughs> attila thank you very very much that was was absolutely fantastic um, George, you might need to unmute people so they can ask questions. Um, Anne Smith saying thank you to everyone for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, Till I had a couple of questions while we we're waiting for other people to to say to say what they want to know. Um, getting back to the Adansonias, um, they're deciduous. You you said they were deciduous trees. When what are they um, deciduous by season, you know, dry season, wet season? When, when are they deciduous? Oh, Adansonias are deciduous in the dry season. So basically yep. uh, hot, humid, wet, tropical storms bring out the new shoots, fruit, flowers, all through. Uh, but it could, uh, uh, Adansonia can remain leafless for a year or two if, if the conditions are poor. Right, I, th I thought that might be the case. And and you said that they've really kind of migrated to Australia and they're coming um, in through that top left-hand corner. Where have they actually, do you think they're... Uh, Ad Ad Adansonia have their heartland in Madagascar, uh, then across to Africa. Madagascar has about eight species of Adansonia. Um, uh, Africa has uh, two species and then all across uh, even to towards India. So, um, but... Uh, the fruit of an adansonia is a large, like a coconut, and it has a hollow space and air cavity, and it's buoyant in water. So it will actually float on ocean currents and also down rivers. So uh, in the river systems of the northwest, the fruit actually are more associated, sorry, adansonia gregorii is associated closely with the river systems of the northwest of Australia. Right. That's fascinating. So uh, they're buoyancy and also, too, uh, they're an important food source, uh, vitamin C and a whole lot of other things. And early human explorers, pre-Europeans, pre-Indigenous Australians, these fruit were considered to have been transported by other races across the globe. So they could have been brought here because uh, the uh, ships, they, uh, scientists state that have come to Australia pre-Europeans uh, uh, have come to the north, northwest of the continent. They could have brought with them uh, food supplies on their boats or canoes or whatever they used. Mm, that's, that's amazing. Um, Judy Horton wants to know um, if that the bottle trees would be less likely 
to develop a swollen trunk where there's plenty of water? Uh, no, water actually will make the stems expand more than normal. Okay. So, so the... when they're dry, they contract. All right, because I've got one Attila that I planted. It's about 40 years old. And um, it hasn't developed much of a trunk. And I've always wondered if it's because it gets too much water. But obviously, you don't agree. So it just must be a no, genetic no. variation. Uh, it could be that it's a hybrid. Uh, it is well known that the distribution range of Brecken Cotton Repestris is primarily Queensland. New mm -hmm. South Wales primarily has the species Brecken Cotton Populaneus. Where the two species almost meet, they merge in a way where there was a hybrid that was given the name because it was a common thing around the location. It's called Brachycotin turgidifolius. And turgidifolius turns out to not be a species at all, but rather an automatic hybrid that seems to, seems to be occurring between the two uh, species. And these don't develop as broad a trunk. Okay, I might so, take a photo and send it to you and just yes, see what please. you think. Yes, and I'll just make a very quick comment that I've also got a discolor, and I find that the the fallen flowers that, that pick them up off the ground uh, always make wonderful decorations at Christmas time. You can put oh, them on the table you've got and they look great. Bingo, Judy, that is fantastic because I love the utilization. When the flowers fall from the tree, it's not litter on the ground; it's a decoration. Use the decorations. My goodness, thank you, Judy. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. I've got I've got one more question, unless anyone else wants to pop one in. Um, now, you you slid over something pretty important, Attila, uh, about the um, brachychitans not always flowering um, all over, and you said there was oh. a good reason for this. And I I think this is something that we're often asked as as horticulturists. You know, why why is it that it doesn't flower some years? It partially flowers. It flowers. Yep. yep. Well, okay. Uh, that's an interesting thing that you asked me. Uh, in the images I showed, I had to be there. I was there as a consultant and I've had questions and I've had to have a look at things. A simple, this sounds silly, but a simple thing like having a semi-trailer park next to or near a tree and have its metallic or shimmering roof shine or glare back on a hot sunny day against one side of a tree and then because I've just seen where, a, a, in one case, a lorry parks next to a house in a particular spot that hasn't been parked there for years, and they've got a new lorry, and it's nice and shiny, and I noticed where it was parked, that side of the tree had the most flowers. Right, so more light, more reflective. It's light, light, reflective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm currently doing a lot of work with Xanthoria, and Xanthoria, some species flower after fire, some species flower ir irregardless of fire. But there are triggers like uh, uh, consecutive days of heat, dry, hot. Um, those things induce stress and stress induces flowering. The most heavy flowering occurs in hot, dry years with brachychitans, same. Okay, that's great. Uh, Gabby wants to ask a question. Gabby, have you got your mic turned on? I do. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, go away. I'll, off you go, I mean, not go away. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Jennifer. Oh, hi, Till. I'm based in uh, northern Tasmania. I do um, some work in landscape design, but also teach geography at University of Tasmania. And just wondering about the role of brachychitans in water-sensitive urban design, particularly with climate um, variability, you know, more intense rainfall and any potential in terms of them helping get water out of our urban environments more quickly or other environments. Um, I showed examples where brachychitans were used in street plantings, and I was I'm more concerned with uh, how they could disturb the built environment, footpath, paving, uh, bitumen, damage, roadwork repair, and also uh, leaf drop, branch drop, and and hazards to people's health. That also uh, extends to proximity to a house or home where. The foundations could be damaged. So uh, when you talk, you, you actually asked an interesting question because you're asking about how can these plants can be used to mitigate water runoff. Yep. They will use or need very little in the way of water. So they'll hold embankments, erosion embankments, and mm -hmm. stabilise them. They're good in that regard. 
but they don't take up or need much water if they're uh, uh, let's say, let's say you're in the Hobart Botanic Gardens where I've seen this tree growing happily. Uh, it would prefer an area where there's good drainage, so slopes. If it's a place where water collects or pools, there's only so much water they can take up once they've reached the limit. You know, uh, so no, I don't believe they will utilize uh, uh, large amounts of water runoff. No, no. So I don't know if I've answered your question properly. I, I've not done enough work on how much water a brachychite naturally needs. I've got yeah. no data on that at all. Okay, yeah, I'm interested too. Interested from the perspective too. of um, uh, yeah, in terms of lands, uh, in terms of uh, bank stabilization, you know, uh, landslides, and that's around soil. You know, in terms of plasticity and um, how much water a soil can hold. So, if you do. Uh, do any more work in this space? I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, well, look, uh, my presentation was merely a cursory look at all the work mm. that I've done. Uh, I've got so much more I could have shared, but I don't have the time. It's probably, it was, I probably put too much into it already, into this presentation. But, oh, look, you'll have to order the book. Ah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was the going book. to say. Can you let us know when the next, when your new well, issue is out? Because I think everyone would uh, like to. Uh, well, currently the old version was thirty-two dollars. The new one will be almost twice the size. It'll be forty-two dollars, and it'll soon be at the printers. I hope or my hat may have it by Christmas, but people can pre-order if you contact our website because uh, I get print runs of a hundred to two hundred copies at a time, and they usually sell out very quickly. So, and then I have to consider what to do next. So, you know, uh, I, I, I'm. Sold out. I had a tour group through uh, uh, this week from uh, America that came over and uh, they um, cleaned me out of uh, all the old stock of that title. Okay. We'll keep we'll keep tabs on that and, and suggest to people that they pre-order from the website. Um, if there's no more questions, anyone got a quick question? I think we'd better, we're getting up to, uh, to one to two o'clock here. So uh, we better say thank you very much. I don't think you gave us too much information. I think you were fabulous though. Learned a lot. Learned a great deal. Well, yeah, I do hope. Uh, my, my intention was to uh, show and share material. See, you know, I use the internet extensively for research. And if I want to research something, simply I'm guilty of looking it up online and I'm satisfied that all the answers are there. There's not much more I could possibly want to know about it. So what I tried to do was I wanted to touch on things that aren't out there yet. I wanted to touch yeah. on ideas that really get you stimulated. And I think you did that very successfully. So thank you. And as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, you'll be back with us next Friday talking about edible succulents. So hopefully we'll all be there again with you for lunch next week. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you bye -bye. very much. And this will be up on our website as soon as we can get it up there. So thank you again. Bye-bye for you. now. Bye.